Amen. Well, let's get our hymn books and stand, if you would, and we'll sing hymn number 52 to start our service. Welcome, everyone. Amen. 52, praise him, praise him. We do serve a holy God. Thank you for that good singing. Brother Wayne Mass, would you lead us in prayer, please? Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Well, amen. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. It is a joy uh, to have each one of you here, and I trust and pray that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. And boy, what a great way to come back from Thanksgiving. You start off a service that He's holy, uh, aspect of worship, of just recognizing how big and awesome our God is. Amen. And then leads right into praise, you know, praise him, praise him. And he's worthy of both of those aspects, isn't he? Yes. Absolutely he is. And uh, boy, I'm just uh, thrilled to death uh, that we get to get in on some of those aspects of how great and awesome our God is. He saved us, he redeemed us, and now we just get to worship and praise him. I love church life. It's wonderful. And uh, I'm just so glad that you are here this morning. Uh, visitors, it's a joy to have you this morning. We are so glad that you're here. Uh, if you actually, really quick, just uh, lift your hand up. Brother Brinson's back there with just a little card. He'd love to give that to you if you hadn't already got one. And we'd love a record of your visit this morning. And that way we could uh, come by and visit you and let you know how much we appreciate you being here. And it's just such a blessing. I do have a, uh, since we're just coming out of Thanksgiving, a cornucopia of announcements this morning. 
a bunch of them, okay? There's a, there's a lot of announcements, and so I'm just going to read these off as quickly as possible uh, and give them to you. Uh, there's a lot of things that are upcoming through the month of December, and uh, we're just really excited about each one of them. Uh, if you would like a, a visit, uh, we're just so blessed. It's our third Sunday here as pastor, and it's been great so far. And we'd love to get to know you better, just as well as I know you would like to get to know us better. And so if you'd like to have a visit where we swing by your home and uh, just get an opportunity to visit with you, there's a sign-up sheet back there with the date and time. And we'd love for you to sign up for one of those so we can come by your house for about an hour-long visit. Uh, just kind of uh, instead of passing by each other in a service, uh, we could actually sit down and get to know each other a little better. And so if you could sign up for one of those, that would be fantastic uh, if you could do that. If none of those time slots will work for you, if you could just let me or my wife know, and we'd be happy to accommodate and uh, work something out uh, with you there. Uh, decorating the church uh, for Christmas. I uh, hear that's a pretty extensive thing here at the church. And so if you'd like to get involved in decorating the church and putting up some of the Christmas trees and Christmas decorations, uh, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., uh, ladies are going to meet up here uh, to decorate and would love for you to get involved in that as well. This upcoming Wednesday is our annual business meeting, Wednesday, December the 1st at 7 p.m. And uh, I encourage you all to come and be a part of that and what's going on in the life of the church. We do have the ladies' Christmas party that's going on this Tuesday, excuse me, not this Tuesday, a week from this Tuesday, December the 7th at 7 p.m. So Tuesday, December the 7th, a week from this upcoming Tuesday at 7 p.m., it's at Miss Linda Baker's house. If you need directions there, you can visit with her or a lot of the other ladies. would be happy to get that to you. Bring finger foods and desserts, and then bring your gift for secret sister reveal that's going to be revealed and then reassigned for this next year. And if you're not involved in secret sister, if you'd like to, you can bring a gift to exchange around $15 uh, to get involved in that as well. There's the adult Christmas party that's going to happen Friday, December the 10th, and that also is at 7 p.m. And uh, we're doing something a little bit different this year. I uh, encourage you all to bring your favorite Mexican food dish. Right, we're going to have Mexican food for the adult Christmas party, and that'll be here at the church Friday, December 10th at 7 p.m. And again, bring a $15 gift to exchange. Men get a men's gift, women bring a woman gift, and there'll be a fun game that we play with all of that. It'll be a great, great time. And then on Saturday, December the 11th, uh, we have directory pictures. If you have not signed up, if you missed the first round of the directory pictures, there's the sign-up sheet on the bulletin board back there. We really want you in that directory. And so if you could sign up for that, uh, for one of those time slots on Saturday, December the 11th, that would help us out tremendously. Uh, on Sunday, December the 12th, two weeks from now, our choir is going to be singing some Christmas songs uh, in the AM service. They've got several songs lined out, and I'm really looking forward to it. They've been practicing on those, and so I encourage you to, uh, to be here in your place on December the 12th that morning for the choir and some of their special singing. And then that night, December the 12th in the PM service, the children will be doing their Christmas program. And uh, that's going to be a blessing. Miss Darla has been working on them uh, over the past couple months, getting them all ready for that. And uh, we're in need of some cookies. So if you make cookies, if you don't make cookies, you can buy cookies. But uh, if you can bring some cookies on the 12th, and you can bring them to the fellowship hall. And uh, we would uh, really appreciate that before the evening service, bring them to the fellowship hall. And following the uh, evening service, the kids are going to have milk and cookies. And I had to make sure that the adults could get in on that too. Okay, yeah, amen. Uh, I always love them cookies. And if anyone's wondering, I don't want to overload everyone, but if anyone's wondering, uh, Preacher's favorite cookie is Snickerdoodles. Okay, I know that matters to a lot of people, but uh, anyways, if you just needed to know that. Okay, I say that and now we're going to wind up with like seven dozen <laughs> Snickerdoodles and nothing else. So don't do that. Okay, yeah, amen. I appreciate that. Brother Pollock said he's going to help us out with that. Okay. He's going to help me eat those snickerdoodles, save him. All right. Uh, Christmas caroling, we're going to do that on Tuesday, December the 14th. We're going to meet here at the church at 6, 
And so I encourage you to come out uh, and get involved in that. We have a great time going around to uh, some uh, folks' houses and singing some Christmas carols. And that'll be on Tuesday, December the 14th. Uh, we are going to do, uh, from what I understand, you all haven't done this uh, at least since uh, Brother Webster was here, uh, but we're going to do a candlelight service on Sunday, December the 19th. That'll be the normal p.m. service time. And uh, really look forward to that. Uh, just a wonderful, uh, more intimate type Christmas service that'll happen Sunday the 19th in the p.m. service, same time as normal uh, for that service there. And then uh, we are going on an activity as well. My family loves to look at Christmas lights, and so we figured the church family might enjoy that as well. And so we're going to go to Prairie Lights in uh, Grand Prairie, and we're going to do that on Monday, December the 20th. And uh, we're going to leave the church around 4.30. Uh, we're going to stop on the way and get supper. And if you would like to be involved in that, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board just to help us with transportation to know uh, what we're going to need there uh, because the park does charge by the vehicles, so we all want to go together and make those arrangements beforehand. And so if you could sign up, that would help us out uh, tremendously uh, with that. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, you'll just need to pay for your, your own meal uh, when we stop for supper and if you want anything extra at the place. Uh, but as far as going, it doesn't uh, cost anything. I encourage you to do that. And uh, we are starting several new sermon series. There's going to be a bulletin next week. I encourage you to grab one of those next Sunday. Uh, it'll outline all these things we've talked about and talk about some of these new sermon series. Uh, but in the first of January, January 2nd, 5th, and 9th, uh, Sunday evening on the 2nd, and then Wednesday night on the 5th, and then Sunday morning on the 9th, we're starting new series in the book of Galatians, Leviticus, and the book of James. And I'm really looking forward to each one of those. I think there'll be a tremendous help and blessing. And if you missed out on Sunday school this morning, we actually started a series this morning in the book of Malachi. And I hope you'll come and be a part of that. Uh, it was a tremendous blessing uh, in the auditorium class we started there in the book of Malachi. Uh, we are doing a revival February the 6th through the 9th. It's a little bit of a different date. That's why I want to give it to you now. February 6th through the 9th. And the reason why it's a little bit of a different date, I scheduled about four years ago a speaker over at my former pastorate over in Kaufman. And uh, just with the nature of what happened with the move and the church and things, uh, he called me and said, uh, hey, what are we doing? And, you know, does the church there, is they expecting me or what it was involved? And I said, no, we never got that on the calendar there. And uh, we really didn't get planned and scheduled for that. And so he said, well, I'd be happy to come to your new church if you'd like to have us. And I said, absolutely. And so we're sure excited. You're a beneficiary of something that's been in the making for about four years. Uh, but uh, we're having Brother Jason Gaddis uh, that's going to come and preach for us uh, on February the 6th through the 9th. And on each of those evening services, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the service will be at 7 p.m. Uh, Brother Gaddis is the president now at Heartland Baptist Bible College, the pastor at Southwest Baptist Church, and a dear friend, and I'm so glad that he's going to be able to come and for you all to be able to hear him. Last announcement, uh, and then we'll be done. There are some uh, nursery workers that are needed. If anyone's interested in being involved in that, there's the sign-up sheet uh, that's back there. If you can just designate what services that you can be involved in. And it's a blessing uh, that we have need of additional nursery workers, a lot of and new kids. And uh, that's sure a blessing. We're sure thankful for that. Well, let's go to the Lord uh, in a word of prayer and just ask his blessing and help on this service and uh, ask that he'd be glorified and magnified in it all. Father, we come to you now, and uh, Lord, even though we've taken some time here to talk about some of the upcoming events, and uh, Lord, we're grateful. Uh, Lord, it's good for a church to fellowship and to laugh together. You say laughter's good, like a medicine, and uh, Lord, we're grateful for that. And uh, But even in spite of going through all the announcements and the time here, Lord, we want to keep our focus on you. We want to recognize the reason that we've assembled here this morning uh, is we want to uh, worship you. We want to lift you up on high. We want you to be magnified. Lord, you said if you would be lifted up, you would draw all men unto yourself. And Father, we're asking this morning that you would help that to be the case. Lord, that uh, maybe somebody's here that's lost, that they'd be saved today. Lord, maybe there's some Christians that have gone wayward and they're not where they need to be with the Lord, that today they'd be drawn back to you. Lord, that today we would learn as we're open to look in the Word of God in the book of Proverbs, that we would use our, our voice, we would use our words to edify and be a benefit and a help to others. And uh, Father, ultimately we just ask that you would be lifted up, you'd be magnified, you'd be exalted. 
Lord, this is your service. This is your day. And may you be magnified and glorified in it. It's in your name we do pray. Amen. And amen. All right, let's get our hymn books again and stand if you would. We'll sing hymn number 74, Saved by the Blood. We'll just sing the first and last verse, and then we'll take up our morning offering. We'll ask the choir to be dismissed on the last verse. 74. remain standing for prayer. Brother Wally, would you word our prayer, please? Amen. Thank you, Miss Tammy. Well, I had a request to do this song actually several weeks ago, I guess, and I kind of forgot about it. Well, I was reminded about it a couple of weeks ago, and so uh, I want to thank you for uh, asking me to do this song, Miss Ferrer. God on the Mountain.
Amen. I appreciate that, Brother Gary. It's sure a blessing. And uh, boy, I'm thankful uh, in those times we go through those valley moments uh, that God's still there. You know, He doesn't bail on us. And uh, the good times and the bad times, God's consistent, immutable, unchanging. And that's sure a blessing. And I appreciate that this morning. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 25 this morning, the book of Proverbs and chapter number 25. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter number 25. We're just going to handle one verse this morning. And so, boy, I tell you, Proverbs, you can take one verse and it sure can pack a wallop. And uh, I'm looking forward to this this morning. I believe it will be a blessing and help to us. If you found your place there in Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 11, if you'll stand with me in honor of the Word of God this morning, uh, just to show respect and deference uh, to the Word of God. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 11. Of course, if you're able to, uh, stand with me and honor the reading of God's Word. If not, we understand those uh, limitations there. Amen. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 11. It says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. A word fitly. It's an interesting phrase there. What does it mean that a word is fitly spoken? And what does it mean that it's like apples of gold and pictures of silver? Well, there's an amazing truth here that we're going to look at about our words and how powerful they truly are this morning. It will be a blessing and a help to us. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right into this text. Father, we come to you again, and we're in great need of you this morning. Lord, help us if we ever get to the place where we feel like we don't need you. And uh, Lord, I need you to preach your word. It's your word. I don't want to misrepresent you. I don't want to say what my ideas are. Lord, I want to say what your word declares. And Father, as your word is uh, preached, Lord, I pray that you would be with the hearers. Lord, it takes, uh, it takes active listening. Uh, Lord, not just for the preaching to go out, but for it to be received. And Lord, I pray this morning you would remove distraction and allow us all to be intent and involved in this process of not only learning what the Word of God says, but then allowing it to be applied to our lives and take root. And Lord, that we would not just be hearers of the Word, but we would be doers also. And so, Father, help us this morning. May you be magnified. It's in your name we do pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Uh, thank you for standing in honor of the Word of God. <clears throat> Always appreciate that. The you know, words are very, uh, very powerful. Uh, there have been some amazing, we might call them wordsmiths, down through the years uh, who have been able to use their words in a very, very powerful way. Uh, one of the ones that I admire a lot uh, when I look back and I read speeches and I hear some of them that have been recorded, uh, just wonderful men who knew how to use the English language in a powerful way. Uh, one of them that I just admire is Winston Churchill, uh, the Prime Minister during World War II over in Britain, and just his uh, command of the English language. And really, uh, through his speeches, I would say this, he single-handedly, I honestly believe, single-handedly uh, rallied that nation to uh, really be the, the front that held Hitler back uh, in his blitzkrieg, at least to, until the Americans got involved in D-Day and all that was there. He was just an amazing, amazing man uh, in some of his speeches. Now, let me give you just a few excerpts. Some of y'all might have heard some of these before. Let me just give you some excerpts from some of his speeches. These are uh, incredible speeches that Winston Churchill gave during World War II, when everything seemed like it was lost, and he kept the nation there, their little island, he kept them going. Here's what he said, You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word, victory. Victory at all cost. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory, however long and hard the road may be, for without victory, there is no survival. Another excerpt, he said it this way. He said, we shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never 
surrender. Still another excerpt, he said it this way, what General Wagelin called the Battle of France is over. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to the duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand men years, men will still say this was their finest hour. Now, listen, a, a nation, we could go on reading some of these. I enjoy reading these speeches, but a, a nation was called to sacrifice. A nation was called to rally to war because of words, be, because of speeches that were given. A, a man's words rallied people. We could even go on the flip side of that. And really, you could point in Germany and say a man's words. The name of Adolf Hitler spurred a nation to war. Words are powerful in both positive and negative ways, aren't they? But we can come down maybe from the level of, uh, uh, of warfare and the level of great leaders and great orators and great speech givers and wordsmiths to you and me. And just the common man and the common woman on the everyday and uh, our normal speech that we use day to day. And I would say this, our words have amazing power an amazing influence. Your words can ruin somebody's day or they can make somebody's day. Amen. You have the power today with your speech to do amazing things. In the New Testament, James said it this way, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Well, I think James was on to something there. He went on to illustrate, it said it's like a bit in a horse's mouth. We just tug a little bit and that bit turns that huge animal and sways it in one direction or another. He said it's like a rudder on a ship. Just that little piece of metal or wood on the back of that ship that then the helm is turned and the whole ship because of that is swayed to go one direction or the other. He says it's in the same fashion. <laughs> Your tongue, although it is very small, is one of the most powerful things in your entire body. It has the ability to boast amazing and great things. Your words have the ability to alter the course of a person's day, or you say it this way, alter the course of somebody's life. Words have the ability to do that. With your words, you can uplift or you can tear down. Your words can minister grace or they can spread corruption and hatred. Amen. Yehuda Bird in one of his books said it this way, Words are singularly the most powerful force available to humanity. We can choose to use this force constructively with words of encouragement or destructively using words of despair. Words have energy and power with the ability to help, to heal, to hinder, to harm, to humiliate and to humble. Words are very powerful. You know, it's not just secular uh, history in the world that understands the power of word and speeches and the sway that they can hold. Uh, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about our speech as well. Boy, it's rife with examples and illustrations of how our speech can be used in very powerful and very motivating ways. A wonderful, powerful medium called words and speech that God has blessed us with. Again, we've already mentioned it over in James chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. We won't read that, that text this morning. I think a lot of people will maybe be familiar with that text. But uh, James 3 actually says it's the smallest member, yet it contains the most enormous power on the human body. James 3 also says it's hard to tame. He says when it gets out of control, like an untamed animal, he said it's like a fire that just sets off into a wild blaze. Have you ever seen that happen? Well, I shouldn't have said that. Oh man, I said this and now it caused, man, relationships have been torn apart over one word that's been used. 
for one conversation. It's how powerful our words are. And James says it's like lighting a, a match and watching the wildfires just burst. That's how dangerous our words can be. Again, James 3 says it this way. He says, You ought not say good things and bad things, or evil things and blessed things from the same mouth. He says, You can't have sweet water and bitter water in the same water source. It doesn't work that way. It's all mixed together. It's got to be one or the other. Kind of the old adage would be uh, this way, you know, not having good things and bad things coming out of your mouth. The old adage would be this way. You kiss your mother with that mouth. And of course, the idea was, how are you going to talk that way and then kiss something as sweet as your mother with the same mouth? You know, that ought not be happening. You have both those things, but it can happen, can it? Our, our words can be used in great good and also in great evil. We also know, if you went a little earlier in the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs 15, 1, we understand that our words can diffuse a situation. Like diffusing a bomb that's about to explode, our words can soften things. Or worse yet, going to the bomb illustration, you know, it always shows the hero cutting the right wire. But you know, if they cut the wrong one, instinct kablooey, you know. Your words can diffuse, but they can also cut the wrong wire. <laughs> they can make a bad situation worse. They absolutely can. And Proverbs 15, 1 says it this way, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. You ever seen that happen before? I love watching our kids, you know, they're going at each other. And instead of one of them having a soft answer to turn away wrath, they usually have grievous words. You did this to me, so human nature means I'm going to take it up to the next level. Isn't that how it works? You know, the Bible says eye for eye, tooth for tooth. You know, when Jesus came in the New Testament and said, hey, that ought not be the case. And a lot of people think that eye for eye, tooth for tooth, you know, life for life was a bad setup. That's a really good law. I mean, Jesus elevated that to a new level. You know why? Because human nature says, you took my tooth, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Come on now, that's how human nature works, isn't it? We don't do tit for tat. We do, you hurt me, I'm hurting you worse. Okay? And, and that's what it means. Grievous words stir up wrath. Come on, you've seen it before. Emerson Egridge in his book, Love and Respect, calls it the crazy cycle in a marriage when things get out of hand, where one spouse says something hateful or unloving, and so the other one asks disrespectful or unloving, and it just gets out of control. And before you know it, you're like saying things and angry at each other. You're like, where did this even start? Boy, it would, we could stop right here and preach on this verse for a while if you want to. A soft answer turns away wrath, the Bible says. Grievous words stir up anger. Yeah, yeah your words have the ability to do either or. Diffuse the bomb or cut the wrong wire. You have that ability with your words. Proverbs 16, 24, it brings out this part. It says, your words can edify, can build up, it can strengthen someone. Uh, your words can take somebody who's down in the dumps, who's done with it, stressed out, they don't want to keep doing it anymore, and your words can be exactly the life-giving thing that that person needs to go the next mile. That's how powerful your words are. Proverbs 16, 24 says, pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. That's good. Yeah, like when you're hungry and you need some, something there. Yeah, you remember Jonathan in the Old Testament, all the soldiers were weary and he didn't know the commandment of Saul that they weren't supposed to eat stuff. And Jonathan takes a little bit of that honey. He was so weak. You know, your blood sugar gets low. He's so weak and so enfeebled. He couldn't keep going. He got a little bit of honey from a honeycomb and he ate it. And he says his eyes were enlightened and he got strength in his body. Hey, when you're hungry... And you're weary and it feels like you can't keep working, you can't keep going, and then you get some food in your belly. It helps you go the extra mile. Listen, pleasant words can do that for a soul that's weary and beat down and anemic and needs something. And your words can be the sustenance that they need to keep going. That's how powerful they are. It's like honeycomb. It's like the energy and the strength that that person needs. In the New Testament, in Ephesians 4, 29, he says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Well, why wouldn't you want corrupt communication to proceed out of your mouth? He tells us why. He says, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Don't give corrupt communication. Give that which is good to the use of edifying. It builds up. Why? So it will minister grace into the hearers. It will do something to them. It will help them. On the flip side of that, in our chapter here in Proverbs 25 in verse number 18, if we were to read down a little further in verse number 18, it actually says there, A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul and a sword and a sharp arrow. Now, I'm, 
I'm not an expert on some of these tools, but a, a maul, a sword, and a sharp arrow just don't sound like nice things to be hit with. No, no expert. I've never been hit with a sword, a maul, or an arrow before, but I don't want to. Now, he actually says here in the text, he says, a man that beareth false witness or uses his words to condemn someone falsely or say wrong things or gossip and backbite, he says it's like they're beating them with a sword or a maul or a sharp arrow. You know, that old kid saying, sticks and stones can break my bones. Words will never hurt me. That is the most untrue statement of all time. It absolutely is. Because sticks and stones, they will break your bones and they will mend a lot faster than a broken soul that's been hurt with words. According to the text here, it seems like Solomon's trying to bring out in the book of Proverbs that someone could take a maul or a sword or a sharp arrow and it would do just as much harm to the soul as it would to the body when words are used as a false witness. According to Colossians 4, 6, our words are supposed to be used to be full of grace and helpful to people. He says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how you ought to answer every man. Now listen, we could go on. Oh yeah, we, we could spend all morning going through the Bible. And here's the thing, the scriptures have a lot to say about how you use this. A lot to, and I'm not talking about eating turkey. Okay, we, we've already done that with Thanksgiving. I'm talking about what comes out of our mouth in our speech. The, the Bible has a lot to say. But we can't even talk about nonverbal communication. Some people say, sometimes what comes out of my mouth and what my face are saying are two different things. Yeah. We could talk about this morning, sometimes we don't say anything, but our face gives that look, you know. Rolling our eyes. Come on. They're, they're all forms of communication. I think the Bible has a lot, a lot to say. This morning, I, I believe if you're a child of God, if you're saved, I think you know that you're supposed to use good speech revolutionary, I know, but I think most of you know that. You've heard it before. You know, hey, I know my words can be used for good and bad, and I know I'm supposed to use them for good. I know they're supposed to be used for benefit. And, and I hope, it's my desire, that you're striving to use your words positively and, and to be a benefit and be uplifting to other people, to be an encouragement to other people. But you know what I have trouble with? I'll just be uh, transparent, a little bit candid here this morning. What I have trouble with is not necessarily striving to have good words that I say, but having the right words at the right time. Fitting words, like appropriate for the situation. When I first became a pastor uh, over in Kaufman, um, I'd been there, you know, I was all of what, 26 years old when I became pastor. I still had a lot of growing to do. I still have a lot of growing to do. Uh, but I remember uh, one of the, the faithful members that was there, he ran our soundboard and, and did the bulletins for the church when we first got there. And he was uh, nearing death. We'd been there for maybe a year, year and a half, something like that. Uh, his name was Brother Danny and just not doing well. And he was in the hospital. All the family was there, had been called in. And I'm there, you know, this is pre-COVID. Everybody just like packs in the hospital room. There's like all these people in there. And I remember the nurse came in, and I'm already, I'm standing over there, and I'm like, what do you say? You know, I, I grew up in a pastor's home, but that doesn't mean I don't know what to say. You know, and I'm over there, and I'm like, I don't know, I, you know, I don't know, what, what scriptures do I read, or do I give encouragement, or do I just say nothing? You know, it's just hard to know what to say in situations like that. And, and then the nurse came in, and there was just kind of some of that residual stuff on the machines that was showing that he was still living, which she said, he's, he's gone, you know, he's, he's already passed. It's probably happened within the last half hour. And I remember just the grief that just fell in that room. You know, many of you all experienced that before. I'm there. It was my first time to experience all that, you know, as not a family member, just being the pastor, the guy, you know, that the family's looking to saying, hey, uh, pray with us. Give us words of encouragement. Tell us something good, you know, and I'm, I'm over there. I'm like, what do you say? Listen, I'm not just, not just in those situations, but just sometimes in casual conversation, I'm like, what is the fitting and the right thing to say here? Because I want my words to minister grace. I want my words to be used for good. And although sometimes I'm well-intentioned, my words just aren't fitting for the situation. And so Solomon helps us out in this text to not only help us understand that right words ought to be used, but he helps us understand right words used at the right time ought to be used. Is, I hope this will be helpful. It's helpful for me to study this. He says in Proverbs 25 and verse number 11, a word fitly or in the right time 
spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. So it says, boy, that, that just blesses my soul. What are apples of gold and pictures of silver? Okay, because I'm kind of the same way. I'm like, I don't know what he's talking about there. I know it's something that's supposed to be like good, but I don't know exactly what it is. So I did a little bit of research on this. The commentaries were so helpful. Apples of gold could either be real apples that were kind of goldish hue. You know, sometimes you have those yellowy looking apples. Some commentators said that could be it. Other people said they weren't apples at all. They were citrus fruits, like oranges. I said, well, why does he call them apples then? You know, that didn't make sense to me. They could be actual gold formed to look like apples. That's a possibility. Or they were like, uh, here it talks about pictures. Some people said it was like an embroidery tapestry where they had sewn in apples made out of gold thread. You know, so that was an option there. Or they were apples that had been painted. You know, you take an apple and they... I almost did that this morning, take an apple and spray paint it gold, you know. So some people said that's kind of what it is. Somebody took gold paint and they painted an apple that way. Whatever it is, whichever of these, I'll tell you what I think it is here in just a second. But whatever it was, understand this, it was intended to be a decorative piece beautiful to the eye. Okay? So the apple of gold was meant to be a decorative piece that was beautiful to the eye. Pictures of silver. What exactly are the pictures of silver? Well, a picture, the word there, we oftentimes think of a picture, something you hang up or we snap. But here the word picture is anything that is put out as an object or something to show uh, as a piece of decoration. So a picture is not necessarily something that's flat. It could be any ornament that's put out as a form of decoration. So many people actually believe what this is. I personally, I kind of adopt to this idea also that the picture is not like a frame and it's not like embroidery, tapestry or anything, but that there was an oriental practice at the time that had made its way over with Solomon. You remember Solomon has all these people from all over the world coming and bringing these riches. And he's got spices coming and weird animals, okay, all kinds of cool stuff. You can read about it over in 2 Kings. All this cool stuff that's coming into his kingdom. And so, uh, excuse me, 1 Kings. So you look through it there, and the, the picture of silver, a lot of people think it was this oriental practice where they'd take these thin pieces of silver, and they would bend them, and they would kind of solder them to make these bowls. Ornate designs like flowers or birds or stuff, they'd, they'd form it. So a lot of people think what this was, and it fits with Solomon, super wealthy, had anything he wanted, is that the picture of silver, the apples of gold in pictures of silver, was more than likely like a bowl, like these wires with these ornate designs, silver bowl with actual gold that had been fashioned in to look like apples that was placed in it. Now some of you are like, my fruit basket at home is just not looking that great now. <laughs> I mean, Solomon's got like legit silver with real gold inside of it. And it's just a fruit basket he puts out for a table decoration. That, that's pretty expensive, isn't it? Amen. Now, it, it points to the reality, regardless of whatever uh, form you fall in of what this is. The apples of gold and pictures of silver is basically this, a piece of decoration. Don't miss it. That had great value and that had purpose to elevate the room that it was in. Isn't that why we decorate? That's why we decorate. We're just moving into the house over there, you know, and uh, my dad said, you know you're moved in when you start putting things up on the wall. That's when it feels like home. And, and I somewhat agree. It was just this last week we finally started putting up some curtains, you know, and putting up some decorations and things. And, and, and so you, instead of it looking bare and just like an empty house with our stuff in it, it's starting to feel like home. It's got pictures of us up on the wall and decorations. Now we do that and we invest the money in, in decorative pieces and, and, and curtains and, and centerpieces on tables and, and you name it. All the decorations that's used in the house. We invest money and we put time into hanging those up. Why? Because it elevates the house to make it feel more like a home. That's why we do it. That's why we use decorations. So we understand that. Most everyone hopefully here this morning would understand uh, a, a little bit about decorating. If there's no decorations or not enough decorations, the walls feel bare, don't they? They feel like they're, they're lacking and like, wow, does anybody really live here? You can go on the other extreme, though. <clears throat> I'll try not to pick on any ladies here this morning too much. Uh, but I've been in some houses where it's like every inch of the wall is covered. 
I walk in and I feel like I'm being crushed, you know. You can't even tell what color the wall is painted, right? There's pictures and crosses. Those are the best, you know. People who collect crosses, different types, and there's like 700 crosses on the wall. Somebody probably does that. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to pick on you this morning. But I think you understand what I'm saying. Instead of it elevating the room, sometimes it takes away, doesn't it? If there's too much, you just feel overwhelmed. And then the worst. It's not too little and it's not too much, but it doesn't match. You walk in and you go, because <laughs> stuff's like, it's not symmetrical or it's not lined up right, you know. Uh, I had to take a bookshelf out of a preacher's office there to make it kind of more homey for me because I was like, it's just unbalanced. It was bothering me. It just wasn't lined out right. So for, for me, you know, if the, the decorations don't go together and they don't match, you just feel like uh, it doesn't elevate the room either, does it? So we understand what Solomon's talking about here, apples of gold and pictures of silver. It's something that's placed out on a tabletop or on a counter or placed on a wall. And it was intended for this. With the expense that was put in, it was meant to elevate and bring beauty and life and energy to that room that it was in. Solomon says in the same way our words, if they're used, right words used in the right way, can elevate it can bring life into the conversation. It can infuse energy into a person's life. This is exactly what it can do. That's pretty awesome. Amen. So I started thinking about it. You know, if this is Solomon comparing decorating to use of words and decorating being used in a way that elevates and our words being used, in, there's, a, there's a correlation here. I understand what he's saying. This makes sense. He says that these words being used fittingly, that's, that's the word that he uses there, isn't it? A, a word fitly spoken. That word fitly, it's like the spokes of a wheel. I almost had my son ride his bicycle across. And then I thought that probably wouldn't be a good idea. But you know, like a bicycle wheel, you know, it's got all the spokes that go around that wheel. Now, what happens is, is when that wheel rolls, each of those spokes distribute that weight so the wheel functions properly. If you can think about it this way, it's like every time the wheel's coming around and each spoke has its turn, it hits just right so it's carrying the weight. That's what the word fittingly means. It means it's hitting right at the right time. A word fitly spoken, it hits exactly at the right time to carry and to do its objective purpose that it was. So a word fittingly spoken is like this ornate, beautiful piece of decoration. It made me think, you know, some houses don't have enough decorating in them, do they? They seem like they're missing out and they don't have what's required to make it feel like a home. Do you know sometimes we ought to say things and we don't? There are times I think the Holy Spirit prompts us to go and share scripture with somebody or share the gospel with somebody, or to comfort somebody that's suffering, going through a hard time. And in our mind, in our heart, we say, I can't do that. Yeah, I think you know what I'm talking about. If you're a believer, you know what I mean when the Holy Spirit begins to prompt you and begins to lay somebody on your heart and say, hey, text that person. Tag that person on Facebook. Hey, call that person. Hey, go over to that house and visit that person. Hey, say something to them this morning at church. Give a, a right word. I think sometimes we refrain using our words and it's like stuff's missing from the decorations. It's not a word fitly spoken. Let's go to the other side of this because we got to go there. Sometimes you can get too much on the wall, can't you? You know, the Bible says even a fool when he holds his tongue is considered wise. Sometimes we say too much. Sometimes we come to a situation and we just want to we just want to give it all at one time, you know. Somebody does something and we're like, boy, I'm going to share Jesus with them. Well, there's some bad behavior. I'm going to correct that right now. Okay, come on. I think sometimes maybe we fall into that camp more than we should. And it's not that you shouldn't say something, but sometimes I feel like we just become overbearing with our words. And sometimes we say too much. When in doubt, keep your mouth closed. Because the Bible says even a fool... When he keeps his mouth closed, he's considered wise. Why wow, that guy's so smart over there? He just doesn't say anything. So the Bible says, where if he opened his mouth, everyone would go, wow, a fool. Okay? Now, listen, that's not to say we shouldn't ever say anything, because sometimes we need to say stuff. 
And we just talked about that. But sometimes, let's be honest, we say too much. Sometimes, just like there's clutter on the wall and it's all decorated crazy because there's too much stuff. It all goes together, but there's too much. Sometimes you're saying the right thing, but you're overbearing with what you're saying. What about this? It's mismatched. Right? It doesn't go together. Right words, wrong situation. We become guilty of that sometimes, don't we? We're saying the right things. That, man, we're saying it in a, in a loving way. It's so good what we're saying, but it just doesn't fit the situation at all. You know what I've started to learn with, with my words is I want my words to be fitly spoken. I want to say the right thing at the right time in the right way. And the only way I know how to do that is to be completely engrossed in the Word of God and totally immersed in prayer. That's the only way I know how to do it. As a pastor, when I come into those situations, I'll be honest, I'm, I just don't know what to say. Just don't. Somebody just passed away, or you're, you're dealing with a, a marital problem, or uh, somebody's having issues with their kids, and, and they're looking at you saying, Come on, preacher. Come on, you're the pastor. Give me what I need. I don't know. You know, when I first became a pastor, I'm like, I'm 26 years old. I got a kid that's two years old. I don't know what it's like to raise a teenager. But you know what I started to learn? I don't, but he does. Absolutely. And as I started moving away from me trying to know what to say and me having the right words and started leaning heavy on prayer and being right with God and being in the Word of God, you know what started happening? What Jesus promised the disciples would happen. I'll give you the words to say at the right time, at the right moment. I'll help you say what you need to say in the right way, in a fitting way. So next time you're going to be around, we're in that holiday season. And some of y'all, I know, you've, you've got some loved ones that either are unsaved or they're not where they need to be with the Lord. And sometimes it's hard to know what to say. I understand that. I get it. And maybe it is, we just need to spend some time in prayer and say, God, will you help me say enough, but not too much, and help me say it in the right way, the right things in the right way. God, will you help me to be able to do that? I don't want to say too little. I don't want to say too much. I, I, but I want it to be fitting and right for the situation. You know what I found? The more we begin to pray and the more we begin to seek the Lord and the more we begin to get in God's Word, our speech is full of grace, seasoned with salt. We use words that are edifying. Be intentional with your speech. Your words have amazing power this morning. Your words can give life or it can destroy. I'm going to end with a little bit of an illustration here. We'll go to the time of invitation. I was a junior at Heartland Baptist Bible College. And uh, I um, had talked to my father-in-law and wanted to meet with him. He wasn't my father-in-law at the time. I was dating his daughter. And uh, I, I said, I would like to meet with you. And he somehow wrestled out of my soon-to-be bride. At that time, we were just dating. That I was wanting to talk to him about us getting married. So he came into that meeting guns blazing. <laughs> I didn't even get to ask. He said no. I'll be honest, I was crushed, you know. I was wanting to get married between my, or I guess it was my sophomore year. I was wanting to get married between my junior and senior year and the last year of Bible college to be married. And he was not in favor of that at all. He wanted us to be graduated and done with school. That was his mindset on it. And, and but I, you know, it was just, I, I left that meeting just deflated. I don't even know how to explain it to you. Just defeated, deflated. I'm moping around. It's the May meeting at Heartland, which is a big deal. There's preachers everywhere. And I'm in the bookstore, and I'm just in there just kind of, you know, I'm just moping around, just having the worst day of my life, you know. And for some reason, he was never there in the bookstore and never with free time. But for some reason, Brother Sam Davison was there. And, of course, Evie grew up in the church there. And and, uh, you know, I'd got to know Brother Sam just being a student there. And he came along and he just visited with me and he goes, all right, what's going on? You know, and I was just like, so I just laid it out. You know, here's the president of the school, you know, and I'm here telling him about my woes. <laughs> Little peon, you know, and, and I, I'm telling him all about these woes. And may I tell you, he took the time right then, words fitly spoken. And... I don't think it was that he knew exactly what to say. It was that he cared enough to say something. 
He could have been doing a million other things, very busy, very important. And he took time for somebody that meant nothing really to him, if I were honest about it. And he took the time to care about what I cared about, to invest in my life. Listen, it might not matter to you, but it matters to someone this morning. And there's some people in this room this morning that we come to church this morning, I hope not in an attitude of, I hope somebody says something good to me that I can receive, but ready to give our words like apples of gold and pitchers of silver to be a blessing and an encouragement to others. How are you going to use your words today? They're very powerful. Choose to use them right. Let's all stand together as we come to a time of invitation here this morning. Have our musicians come. Father, we thank you. Lord, I love the gift of communication. I love the fact that we can use our words. And not only that we can use our words, but they're so powerful. They're so powerful. And Lord, I pray we would use our words to be an encouragement, be uplifting. Maybe there's a teenager here this morning that has been wrapped up in this uh, gossip or dissension or backbiting in the school. And Lord, I pray that you'd help them to learn that they need to use their words to be uplifting and positive and encouraging. Lord, maybe this morning there's a man who is struggling at the workplace and just doesn't seem to have the right words to say when he knows he needs to witness or knows he needs to be an encouragement to his workmates that are there. Lord, I pray you'd help him. And Lord, I pray that all together as a church we would covenant together to use our words to minister grace to the hearers and to have words fitly spoken. Lord, that people would be able to say, hey, it was like apples of gold and pictures of silver. It was like the perfect decoration for the room, the perfect words for the occasion. Father, bless us now. We need you. It's in your name we do pray. You respond as Lord to have you to the musical play.